Thank you, Stephen. A great start. Um, the additional 30 seconds Stephen was over, Hernando, I'll credit to you. So please uh, start us with a rebuttal. Thank you. <clears throat> that was terrific. <laughs> Who can disagree? <laughs> we all believe in aid. It's even uh, a religious precept. It's in the Koran. It's in the Bible. We all agree with that. How can we disagree? What we are really talking about is whether aid as it is structured today causes harm or more harm than it does good. Obviously it does good. We heard a case for it. I would disagree with it. What's the objective of aid? The objective of aid is essentially a seed, a first seed, a stimulus to begin development so that we from the third world can look like you from the first world. Now how does that work? Well, cotton capital, obviously. You need capital. There's nothing in this city that indicates that you don't need capital. You need credit. You need business organizations to pull all this together like you needed organizations to pull this conference together. And you need, at the same time, obviously, a government that makes sure that things don't get guided one way or tied up into monopolies. So the question I will ask by walking you through three problems that are faced every day is the following. How do you raise capital if you're a developed or a developing country? First of all, how do you help your poor, the subprime market? And third, how do you untie aid? And how do you get rid of monopolies? So let's begin, with the, let's begin right at the beginning. First of all, how do you raise capital? Well, you're a Canadian company, you're a U.S. company. So it's not to make it personal, I'll take a U.S. company. You're a U.S. company, you find petroleum in Peru. You go in, you get a concession. You ask the government to give you a property right on it. It gets a property right. You don't trust the Peruvian government. So what you do is you have your government, and that's where it begins because it's government supported, to sign a bilateral investment treaty between the United States and Peru where the rules of the game are set. In that bilateral investment treaty, you tie the hands of the develop developing country in terms of tax, aid, and in terms of the property rights involved. Labor and legislation can no longer change the basis of that treaty. You then take this over to the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, again government in the United States, and you tell them, confirm my property right and let me know that the U.S. government is behind me if the Peruvians ever do something against the system. Then you go to the middle, uh, multilateral investment guarantee of the World Bank and put the whole world on the face of Peru that they've got to honor their stuff. Then with that property right you couldn't have gotten in Canada or the United States basic taxes and labor tied up and, the, and no, 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 no uh, uh, exception to expropriating by any means. You then go to the capital markets and say, have I got a title for you? And that's where the money comes. There is no such thing as money or capital without a property right. You get money because you give something in exchange or you give a guarantee in exchange. Then the company gets into the center of Peru and starts operating with the, back, the backing of the United States or a European country. And at that time, out comes the second head of Janus. And the second head of Janus is no longer your export credit guarantee department, no longer your diplomats. It is the aid system of the United States or of Western Europe, which then says, we've also given money, by the way, to a lot of people who believe in indigenous rights. What are you doing here sitting on indigenous people's face? Then all of a sudden, developing country sees two heads. Janus, the god with two heads. And that second head starts saying, these are indigenous people. They have the right to roam. They, you're intruding on them. And all of a sudden, in countries like mine, all hell breaks loose. And all hell breaks loose because you're supporting actually both sides. Now, why doesn't this happen in countries like the U.S.? And why doesn't it happen in countries in Europe? Because your left and your right are part of one government, and there you actually are able to work things out. But when you go abroad, the way that you do your things is, it's part of your national conciliation, you go out and you give the treasury to the right, and you give aid and the ambassadorship to the left. And therefore, what you do is you have in front of you Paul Rubin at the Treasury, Bob Reich at Labor. You've got Tim Geithner at Treasury. You've got Susan Rice in the United Nations. You've got Christine Lagarde of France in Treasury, and you've got Kushner to talk to your left. Now, this is all great because you got your act together, but what have you done to us? Because you've produced what Marx called a social contradiction, and therefore, our class, the guys who speak English, the guys who understand all the jokes 
in, uh, in, what if, in Saturday Night Life, like me, are really happy. We got the investment. We're working well. But all our poor people are working against the property system, and therefore you get the kind of discourse that you're talking about, which is essentially a left versus right discourse applicable to developed countries, not to developing countries. So just like there are Hutus and Tutsis warring in developing countries, there are Israelis and there are Palestinians. In your country, there's left and right. And what your aid system does is essentially confront us with each other because a lot of those conflicts, as we shall see later on, are created by yourselves, by the way your system is structured, because it speaks with two faces. Subprime, so same thing. All of a sudden, you've got, uh, you've got the United States. You all know about the recession. I don't have to tell you about it. The only thing that's interesting about subprime is that while you have given all us developing countries something in the course of about $300 billion, as was pointed out by Stephen, on the other hand, we have given you $2 trillion because our money went to the United States and it went to Europe. And that's what basically financed subprime. Now, why did it go there? We developing countries have higher return on capital and we have higher interest rates. It went there because you've got property rights. It is much easier to fund finance in the United States or in the Western world because you've got something to hold on to. Now, the question then becomes, why don't we have property rights? Because you've got a huge world machinery that is against indigenous people having property rights. And it's because of your internal guilt trip in Canada and in the United States and Europeans and colonizers, whereby you are unwilling to recognize what you do for white people to do it for developing countries, that you have again exported your social contract to us. And that's really a problem because, you see, it's not an Indian minority in our countries. It is the overwhelming majority, and that's what it's called by the way aid is managed today and the way the world is splitting. And last but not least, untying aid. You are, obviously, all the people dedicated to aid trying to untie your aid. And it's absolutely true. And I thank you deeply from your heart. But you haven't seen what you've done. Aid is untied at your aid level. Say SIDA. Say anything. But on the other side, you've got export credit organizations that tie them up through specifications. So you get all the grants of the world saying, we're going to design a hydroelectric plant for you. But the specifications, of course, we must make sure that they're correct. So French engineers will look at them. And they'll write specifications which will tie it up. So on the one hand, what you've got is this amount of aid untied and this and amount of export you know, credits tied. You to it's up. a contradiction. Thank Perfect. You. Thank you.